Hey there folks. So I've got a very special treat for today's video here. Uh, I've got some of the new funny playing kits for the Game Boy Advance SP. Um, I did very recently install the GBA version of the ITA kit in an SP with one of their prototype housings. Uh, but this time around I've got their actual intended to be installed in the SP version of the kits. Um, go ahead and get that checked out. Uh, so here's what we get. This is the 3.0 IPS one instead of the ITA. Uh, I do have the ITA kit and we'll be checking that out um, in a little bit. I'll put it head to head with the GBA ITA I did. Uh, but we saving the ITA kit for a different video. Anyway, here's what we get. We've got this piece of foam here. Uh, it's got adhesive on one side. Not 100% sure what this is for. I'm probably going to have to pause and review the instructions at some point. Um, I've also got this little piece of white foam. Uh, I'm guessing that goes over the back. Uh, well, once it's all assembled to try and keep things from flopping about. And then we've got the ribbon cable itself with um, a single wire for wiring up the uh, brightness controls there. Interesting, there are two solder pads and they both go to the same trace. Oop, that was out of focus, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, hardware wise, I expect this to be pretty much identical to the other versions of this kit. Um, if I recall correctly, this does have the FRM feature implemented. Thankfully, unlike the launch version of the GBA 3.0 IPS, um, but nonetheless, we'll get to that in a moment. Go ahead and set this aside for now. I've also got some extras here. Got... We'll go ahead and take care of this at the same time. I've got some brand new clear funny playing membranes, uh, some brand new clear funny playing buttons, and the uh, LED button board from Funny Playing for the SP, and uh, all provided by uh, Retro Game Repair Shop for me to check out today. Uh, and tonight, don't oh, I suppose I should uh, talk about the shell here. I've also got um, one of the brand new Funny Playing SP housings. I don't think we need to use Funny Playing's SP housing for their 3.0 kit, but we will need to use one for the. ITA kit just because the LCD itself is so much bigger and this has the mold adjusted for that. Um, decided to go with blue, mix things up a little bit. Uh, I've also got one of the clear ones uh, that um, I'll check out when we do the ITA kit. That way we can do an apples to apples comparison. Uh, anyway, let's get this cracked open here. With the housing, I'm going to have to be careful about where I leave this because I don't want to get it all scratched up. Um, unlike the other SP shells out there, uh, Funny Playing decided to go with glossy for the finish instead of uh, satin. And I I've heard some opinions on it, and I don't necessarily agree. I think glossy is uh, fantastic, but, you know, teach their own. If you don't like glossy, well, sorry. <laughs> anyway, shell comes with the pretty standard affair of accessories. Unlike the prototype I checked out, this one actually does have uh, screw covers, um, and hopefully some of the other issues I pointed out are fixed. I suppose we can quickly eyeball that. Um, it looks like they've made some pretty significant improvements to the speaker grill itself. Uh, I can still see some of the weird mold lines, uh, flow lines of the that the plastic left as it was flowing around the holes in the mold. Um, but unlike the prototype I have, the plastic is is fully filled. Um, in the prototype, the plastic like there there's chunks of material missing where the plastic didn't flow well enough. Um, so I think they've still got a little bit of ways to go to. Um, really perfect that but it's certainly a lot better and um, 
The other issue I remember offhand was that some of the screw holes were a little bit too shallow and the, screw, the included screws a little bit too long. Uh, so we'll have to check that out when uh, time to fully assemble comes along. I'm going to go ahead and set this aside. And now we're going to take a look at tonight's donor. Uh, that is a bare SP motherboard that I found on my desk. Um, don't ask. <laughs> uh, it, it does work. I have tested it. All is well. Um, the only thing I haven't tested is the link port and the charge port, but won't really need to bother with that for today. Okay. Uh, so I guess let's, let's start with the install. Um, I have already tested this to make sure that this works, but it should go without saying that if you're modding a Game Boy, you should know whether it works beforehand, just in case it doesn't work afterwards. So you know, well, is it the mod that I installed? Is it something else, etc.? So I have tested this. Um, but let's go ahead and partially reassemble it. I've got an LCD here. There it is. This is an AGS-001. Come on. And, oh, I need a game. How's about Pokemon Emerald? I always test with that. We'll get some baseline power usage numbers. And then plug in the kit, test that, and compare with the other kits. Okay, 3.7 volts. One close to the cart slot is positive. One day I will memorize this and I will still check every single time to make sure I'm not getting it backwards. <laughs> so the console works just fine. Got volume difficult. Everything as far as I can tell. Front light works. So, in the overworld, exact same game I'm always testing at. Exact same voltage, 3.7 volts. Uh, beforehand, with Pokemon Emerald, this console is pulling between 59 and 61 milliamps, which you can't... If you've seen me run Game Boy Advance or Game Boy Colors, and I've called out, you know, oh, that thing's pulling 100 and something milliamps. You can't directly compare it because this is at a higher voltage. You have to compare the wattage. This thing is pulling about um, 0.2 watts. So it's about the same as any other Game Boy, just higher voltage, lower milliamps. Uh, but anyway, we know it works. I'll power that off. We'll get this screen ripped out of here. And I will set that aside for future baselines, because I'm sure I will need it. Right. I'll just dump out that wire right now. Alright, open that bad boy up. Screen gets plugged in, pins down. I think. That sounds about right. Sure. Does this thing have a touch sensor? I don't recall. I don't think it does. Which is weird. I think the SP... The ITA, the SPITA kit does have a touch sensor, I think. Is that this bad boy? Let's just take a quick, quick sneak peek, huh? Oh no, that's not a touch sensor. That's just for the backlight ribbon, which we'll get into. Anyway, moving on. Hey, look, it just works. Excellent. Oh. 
Try that again. All right, so in the overworld, on the default settings with no soldering, um, 3.7 volts, the console is pulling 110 to 119 milliamps, which isn't... I mean, it's a lot. It's about double what it was stock, but that's not terrible, I guess. Um, so double the power draw means half the battery life, uh, unfortunately, but that doesn't seem too bad. Uh, but if we solder it up... Hey, it's not working. Maybe it's just making exceptionally bad contact. Nope. I guess I'll have to get that soldered up and we'll try it from there. Uh, yeah, let's do the soldering first. I am going to solder this up beforehand and then desolder it uh, because I want to get some definitive power usage numbers and this is going to be the next thing I solder up afterwards. And uh, this will skew the results. I'm going to do things a little bit out of order. The uh, button gets soldered to this Q12B via right here. Flux that up. Where'd my wire go? Doesn't have to be perfect. Especially since I'm going to undo it in a few minutes. I don't know why I turned that off. Alright, there we go. Try not to flip it off with my index or my middle finger again. Alright, so if we... Oh, I crashed. <laughs> This is one of the pitfalls of doing everything out of the housing is every time I press down on the board I'm flexing it a little bit. Okay. There we go. So at minimum brightness, if you do get it soldered up, at 3.7 volts it is pulling 102 to 110 milliamps, not too bad all things considered. And where is my spudger? There it is. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight levels of brightness. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And at max brightness, it is pulling 204 to 210 milliamps. Ooh, peaked at 217, actually. Interesting. Uh, I believe if we hold this, it should bring us into the OSD. Indeed it does. And then that gives us the exact same options as the uh, GBA version. Oh, interesting. It seems the FRM feature does affect the power usage a little bit. Uh, so at brightness level 8 with FRM off, now the console's pulling 205 to 208 milliamps. Which, I mean, it's not a lot different, but it is different. That's unusual because usually um, the color filters and display effects don't seem to affect the power usage but this must be turning on extra features in the FPGA that controls this thing. Fascinating.
All right, so I'll go over this a little bit more when we have everything fully assembled. Um, but there's some cool new stuff. Now that I've got some power usage numbers, I'm gonna go ahead and I suppose I need to desolder this right here. 10 that up, 10 that up. Oop, I didn't switch that off. Nothing quite like soldering on a board with power in it. That off. And let's get connected this uh, LED board. So I will test this in a slate at some point because I'm sure that question is going to come up. Um, in fact, I got one disassembled for purpose of testing it here. And this board is a flat flex board. It is very thin. Uh, the only real constraints are where the parts are. Um, but I did check the alignment and yeah. I tried to stick with uh, the, the stock constraints when I designed this housing. So anything that fits in a stock SP should also fit in here. And I don't see any real clearance issues aside from um, I'm using the older membranes that are interfering with the LEDs. The new membranes are probably the exact same. Let's find out. Yeah, these look pretty much identical. So, if it works with these, it'll work with these. But anyway, I don't see any actual clearance issues. I can drop this in here and then drop a board on top of it and everything does seem to fit. All the buttons are still accessible and so on. Um, but I only have the one board as of right now, so I didn't wanna install it and then try risk uninstalling it and so on, so here we go. Let's start with this VCC right here. Oh, that is a nasty solder joint. Tweezers to hold the board down so it actually gets soldered down flat. I think I've hit everything. Oh, no. There's still three down here. There we go. I think that's good. Hey, we've got the power. Excellent. 
So since I'm going to be doing a clear shell, I think now it's the best time to clean this up, but I left my IPA in the kitchen. All right, don't worry, I found it. Not strictly necessary, but you know, it's gonna be clear housing, might as well do it right. Do be careful of getting IPA around these buttons. Um, as long as your cotton swab is not like dripping wet, um, it's probably going to be fine, but IPA will seep inside these buttons and um, it won't ruin them, at least not until it evaporates. But um, until it evaporates, your button's not going to work right. It's kind of a pain in the butt to get inside these buttons. Not too bad, because you could always just um, peel up the little bit of plastic tape at the edge and then just lift the contact. I'm not going to do that, though. But it does work. Anyway. Uh, we've got this solder pad here for LCD. And I don't think... I don't think that we have easy solder pads for the other buttons, like on the Game Boy Color kit. I didn't think so. These are for programming the microcontroller. But this is an easy solder pad so we don't have to use that via and snake the wire in between. We could just use that pad. I am going to ask Funny Playing to see if we can get these two buttons um, translated to up here um, or somewhere in this vicinity. Same as... no, sorry, select Okay, just select, <laughs> because we use L and R for the uh, sleep backlit kit, select L and R. Anyway, still got a little bit of sticky here. Plug this back in. Oh, and of course that was on. Why wouldn't it be on? Alright, so this takes over A, B, start, and select, because uh, it has button inputs for both of those, and for the LCD, but I think that's just a pass-through. Let me look up what the button controls are for this. I'll be right back. Okay, so it is select A and B to increase the and decrease the brightness of the uh, LEDs, where it's supposed to be. I'm having a hard time making that out from here, though. And then start A and B to change the color. Oh, there it goes. Oh, but now the Game Boy's off. That's weird. Hold A and B two seconds to change the mode. Oh, maybe that's why it wasn't working. We were in the wrong mode, mayhaps? There we go, yeah. I don't know what mode we were in, but we were in the wrong mode. Okay, so max LED brightness. Brightness of the screen all the way up, oops.
and FRM on, you know, worst possible combination here. Um, the console's only maxing out at 230 milliamps, so this LED board does basically fuck all for power usage. There we go, now we know. Um, I kind of always suspected as much, but I never actually measured it because I figured if you're adding a feature like this to your Game Boy, you don't really care about battery life anyway. Ah, oh, I keep turning that off and I still need it. <laughs> um, but I guess at the same time it is nice to know, for sure. Alright. Let's continue though. We're already almost 30 minutes into this video and haven't even started with the with the headline topic. I suppose before moving on real quick. Yeah, that seat's no problem. I don't I don't anticipate any issues. Um, I'll do a full install at another time though. Because I'm going to have to test with one that doesn't have the uh, brackets and has an actual, um, the actual V3 slate. But it seems good. Any of the constraints that I anticipate are um, nowhere near where parts are. Anyway, um, install. So normally you'd start with a fully assembled SP, tear it down, etc., etc. And we get to the point where we have the SP almost entirely disassembled. Um, we can assemble this entire thing from parts purchased from Funny Playing or other vendors, uh, with one exception. The hinges. Oops. The hinges that connect these two panels together. Um, and it does make a significant difference. For example, this housing has really crappy hinges in it. You notice it does not snap closed. It snaps open, but it doesn't snap closed, which makes me think it's one of these two hinges. I've never put enough effort into figuring out which hinge does what, um, but the left hinge is OEM, the right hinge is aftermarket, and honestly, I think the problem is with the OEM one here. But it doesn't matter too much because I also found this in the parts bin, which has much better hinges in it. You can hear it still snaps nicely, but more importantly, it snaps closed. Um, I have made this mistake previously with videos where I've assumed it was a shell problem and not a hinge problem. And quite frankly, I have no idea what's going on with this shell because it looks like it has two right hinges and yet it works totally fine. Uh, so I'm just going to extract the hinges from this and call it a day. So I made a tool to extract these once you've got the SP torn down to these two panels. Um, you just pop that in there and then you can release the clips very easily and then open up the shell and take whatever tool you can fit in there and you can push them out the remainder of the way. I usually use a screwdriver because that's what fits, but I haven't had a sledger this time. Um, I don't recommend using a screwdriver for that because that's a good way to break the clips. Anyway, I do have a full video on this. Oh, we should... I should not get ahead of myself. So in here, dump that out. Oh, that's weird. I did not expect that. So looking at the pictures, I expected this to be the same ABS plastic that the housing is. I mean, it certainly looks like the same color, but this, hard plastic, ABS. This, definitely not ABS. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, feels like a silicone of some sort, but... Anyway, this is the part we wanted. I am going to just clip the sprue off with flush cutters. And 
then we slide the hinge cover onto the HIMG. And then if we open the shell up to about that angle where it's normally supposed to be open, if you look in the hole you can see there are keyways, they should be lined up. And then you can look at the keyways on the hinge itself. And then just uh, slam it home. And then same thing with the other side. Uh, like I said, most OEM housings use a hinge with uh, black clips on the left and white clips on the right. I have no idea why this one is different, but I'm not going to question it. And ta-da! Now we can, can continue with the install. So this goes in here. Let me figure out what this does. I am fairly confident this goes somewhere like here, but let me double check. Yeah, hey, not bad for a total wild shot in the dark. That's exactly where that goes. I don't know why though. So I'm going to try it without and see what I run into. Uh, this goes or is intended to go right here to, I guess, keep everything uh, kind of clean looking and to prevent rattle. I want to give this guy a single loop and then feed it through. Some reason I put this panel on the bottom because why wouldn't I? There we go. That just goes together like that. Like, everything feels seated. I don't know. It's kind of weird. All right, let's reassemble, though. I'm going to sort the screws real quick, see what we've got. Uh, so normal SP has two different screw lengths and two different screw heads. Uh, so we just have long screws and short screws, not counting the battery cover. Uh, but that one should be a captive screw. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven long screws, and then one, two, three, four, five short screws for the screen, three short screws for the motherboard, and then two more screws for the housing. Uh, the funny playing shell only comes with um, one screw head, so these are all going to be GIS. And then because we're screwing metal into plastic, um, we don't want to over tighten it. So I'm just going to bottom out the screws. And then once they hit the bottom, just like that, back them up a quarter turn or so. And that's it. Easy peasy.
finish feeding that through and now we can install the hinge cover just goes in like that hold the uh, thinger out of the way oops I already messed up. Uh, there should be a long screw in the hinge cover. Um, and we should have used the short screws for this. Uh, I didn't mess up, <laughs> but I came very close to it. I even set aside five screws for the screen. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking there. <laughs> Putting too long a screw in the wrong screw hole usually results in those like little divots you see on the other side. Um, Thankfully, I think we're going to be fine here, so I'm just going to leave those other two. So we only need four long ones left. Oh, no, we don't. We need the other two. I forgot about the shielding. You'd think with how much experience I have with SP consoles, I wouldn't make silly mistakes like this. Oh. See? Totally looks fine. There, dump these out. Ugh. Turn off the flashing. Ooh, it comes with a clear volume cover too, volume slider. soon as I pause, every single time. Okay. Last one. We don't need this anymore. Save it for shenanigans or recycle it. Or toss it. Whatever. I'm not your mom. Might as well trim the rest of these, though. Okay. Alright, don't forget the light pipe. Don't forget the uh, speaker cloth grill for the speaker. 
Um, this serves an actual functional purpose. It's not just aesthetic. Uh, the entire the entire purpose for this thing existing is to keep magnetic debris from sticking to the speaker cone, uh, which probably isn't a problem for most people, but if you know, you know. All right, last up, we've got the um, volume slider. Not all SPs have a removable volume slider. So if you, you know, give this a little bit of a tug and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, just leave it. It's not coming off. And this one is not coming off. Um, some of them are removable. Some of them just break the thing off. Um, both the motherboards I have on my desk right now, ne neither of them are coming off, but I have removed them before. It is a thing. Uh, God, I thought I had an SP on my desk with one removed. But of course I don't. Why would I? Oh, there it is. Ta-da. They're removable. It does work. I guess it's just luck of the draw. Okay. Now we can finish the install though. Now I can solder this up and turn off the soldering iron. Just like that. Now it's on. Hey, no, 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 no. Okay. My cat was trying to uh, join me on my workbench here. <laughs> ah, oh no. This is my least favorite part. Every single build because I do this every single time. I put all of the parts in, and then I flip it up to get this connected and all of the parts fall out. There we go. Okay, let's get the speaker. Ugh. And there we go. Opening up the housing gives us a little bit more slack on that ribbon cable. Just a little bit. Might be enough. All right, three short screws, not the long ones. These ones are definitely short. And if you use the long ones, you are going to have an exceptionally bad time. In fact, I didn't even finish screwing these in because on the prototype shell, these screw holes were... Uh, Not great, or, or the screws. I don't know if they give shorter screws or if they buff the screw holes or what, but. Ah, these are fine. Okay. Well, that's nice. Oh, no! The, 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 the wire. Eh, you know what? It's fine. <laughs> it looks bad, but it's fine. I'll uh, fix it later. There's no chance I don't take this thing apart again. Uh, you know what? After just putting that out into the world, I think I sealed my fate and um, just committed to never taking this thing apart again, so... Let's just fix that. Yeah. A shorter wire would solve this problem. But the wire is longer because um, not everyone's going to be using the LED board. So it is what it is.
And look at that. How easy was that to fix? Cool. Move on to the rear housing here. And we need that little baggie full of parts that I somehow have managed to lose. Oh, it's just one of those days, isn't it? Ta-da! Alright, so in yet another baggie we have the shielding. Which... Needs these little bad boys poked out, I guess. Little adhesive dots stuck in there. And then the metal part, which I'm just cleaning off with my shirt real quick because I'm not going to be able to get to it again. Uh, metal part goes down. So the insulated part faces you. And then we can take our long screws, two of them to be precise. One goes there. One goes there. Then we install our square nut. Are these directional? Nope. I think some of the older OEM ones work a little bit better in one direction than the other because they have a chamfer. But this one doesn't. Doesn't matter goes in there and then our shoulder buttons these springs are directional the left spring only works with the left button and so on did I only get one spring oh funny playing you son of a gun no it's still in the bag That bad boy lined up, drop the axle in, the dowel pin, and then put the whole thing in the housing and then we just need to arm the spring by putting tension on it and letting it rest on the little tab in the battery compartment. Easy peasy. That gives us a little bit of preload on the buttons. Switched off, switched off, and then it just drops on, just like that. And we've got one. screws for each corner, one for each corner, and then the two short screws, one goes in the battery compartment, and the remainder goes into the cart slot. Just like that, it's all done. Yeah, that's pretty neat. <laughs> Kill the lights so you can see a little bit better. Oh, and of course now all you see are the LEDs themselves and not what they're 
intended to be illuminating. Um, I guess LEDs in a shell this clear isn't necessarily the best idea, but maybe in an opaque shell would work a little bit better. Just brightness. Change the color. Maybe. Thought we could. Oh, that's just also brightness. That's weird. Sure. Thanks, funny playing. Real intuitive. Oh, the buttons almost feel sticky. They aren't, but they almost feel it. It's kind of weird. Like, they press down fine, but it feels like they should spring back up at, at you into your finger, and it, they don't do that. They, they release as soon as I take my finger off. Um, that's bizarre. Like, it feels totally fine, it just feels different. I don't know if that's an artifact of the, um... Oh, that's annoying. Um, I don't know if that's an artifact of the membranes, the buttons, the housing, or the uh, LED kit, because there's so many new, um, new factors, new parts here. You know, with how this thing is behaving, it almost makes me wonder if there's not a button stuck down. It's just, just holding A makes the brightness goes up, and just holding B makes the brightness go down. But like, my start works fine. My select works fine. Hmm. Oh. I didn't install the uh, little thingies. I figured I might have to get back in there, so I stopped. These little screw covers. Are these all the same? I think they are. Ah, okay. So there's three on one side and two on the other side. It was hard to tell until I got it off the sprue, but the... Oops. But the two are a little bit thicker than the three. So you should probably save those ones for the corners. Because the entire purpose of the original ones is to prevent the housing from grinding against itself when it's closed. Um, and also to hide the screws, but multi-purpose. Okay, let's get some test rooms going. I don't expect this to handle any differently than the Game Boy Advance version that I just did a video on, but might as well double check. Oh, my screen is totally crooked, too. Oh, I will have to get back in here. I don't know how well you can see that, but the screen is... Yeah, that ain't great. <laughs> I thought it was just totally crooked. I didn't realize it was totally sunken in. I thought the whole point of the foam was to... Uh, Prevent something like that. Uh, anyway. Uh, let's do first things first. Grid. 
We've got no visible area cut off. That is a good sign. I didn't expect it, um, but yeah. We've also got a pretty decent aspect ratio. Um, what else did I want to check? I might as well pull up the color bars so you can see what that's supposed to look like. There's supposed to be individual um, different shades of gray on the left and right here on the camera. I don't see those whatsoever, but in person I do see them. I bring down brightness. No, that doesn't help. Uh, color bars. You can see each individual shade of color. If the camera focuses. There we go. More color bars. And this is actually... Uh, one of many colors, so we have the normal colors, oversaturated mode, black and white mode, and then DMG mode. Personally, I don't care for these still. Alright, and let's do shadow sprite. So we already have FRM on, which is resulting in exactly zero flickering. Looks exactly like it's supposed to or um, I guess like it's intended to. Uh, if we go into the menu, however, turn that off, you can see we get some flicker, and then already I've got some um, flicker artifacting in the screen itself. This is not great with FRM off. So that being said, I don't really see any caveats to just leaving FRM on constantly. I mean, maybe a little bit of extra um, power usage, maybe a little bit of extra latency, latency, um, but I don't think, I don't think it's going to make a big enough difference to matter. Um, oh yes, and then our scaling mode. So right now I have it set to uh, display option one, which you can see the vertical scaling. Ooh. There we go. You can see the vertical scaling is uh, nice and even using integer scaling, but the horizontal scaling is not. So what we're going to do is come into the menu here. I'm going to change. Oh. Uh, change that to display option two. You can see changes. It enables anti-aliasing mode and then display option three is display option one, which is nice and sharp, but with the pixel grid. And personally, with this specific kit, I think the pixel grid option makes things look a little bit better. Just a little bit. Mm. Come on. Unlock. There we go. Yeah. I, I don't see any real differences between this and the Game Boy Advance version of this kit, aside from the fact that it's all designed to use this single button instead of select LNR or a touchpad. But, I don't know, it seems fine. And yeah, um, all of my buttons seem to be working exactly like they're supposed to, so... That whole brightness thing with this LED board, I don't know what's up with that. I'll have to look into that. Maybe it's just a failure of my understanding on how this thing is supposed to work, or... Yeah, I have no idea, because now it's not doing it. But of course it's in a pulsing mode, so... I don't know. It is pretty neat that um, you've got the rainbow vomit option, though. That's nice. Alright, let's fix the screen. There is no single way that putting this, or not putting this little piece of tape down at the bottom is going to cause it to sink in from the top. And yet, here we are.
Oh. That's what I was afraid of. Oh, thank God. <laughs> uh, that flew off, but it still landed on my desk. I used the short screws, they're much easier to get out. As soon as I did that, the screen slipped back into place. What the heck, man? It was the wildest thing. Oh well, I guess I'll install this. Um, maybe the point of it is to prevent the board from flexing under the foam. So it's probably a good idea. Uh, but you know what else is a good idea? Turning off the Game Boy before doing something like this. Stuck. No. Okay, there we go. I had it off center. I didn't want that to interfere with the fit. Okay. And now we can use this tape too. Which I left this off because I figured I'd come back and redo the do the foam anyway. Seems kind of silly, almost like Funny Playing should be doing this from the factory. Because there's only one way to get this lined up, you know? Okay. Just like that. Ta-da! Uh, and then we can reinstall this, I guess. Um, Funny Playing does also sell these like PVC plastic cutouts that you can get um, that are this shape. I think Retro Modding also sells something similar, but they're prints instead of just solid colors. Um, I don't know, pretty neat. I think Retro Game Repair Shop has something similar too. At least I've seen it with some of the the UV printed shovels. I don't know if it's like a regular thing. Quite frankly, I think it looks cooler just being able to see the electronics, so I've never really looked into it. Um, but since the foam here is load bearing, it's kinda, kinda necessary, unfortunately. Okay, so now it's seated, but if I clean this again, I'm pushing the screen down. I am quite significantly, but it should come back up. I wonder if maybe we need a little bit more foam or thicker foam or something, or maybe I just fold it over so it only presses down on that side. I don't know. These little screw covers make such a shocking difference, though. All right. Shada. One more thing. I know Funny Playing included a Nintendo logo, but I want to use one of these new fancy bubble logos that I have. Um, I don't know if these are out yet because the ones they sent me are samples. 
but they're just replacement pill emblems for the console, um, except that they are 3D shaped. If you can, if you can see that, maybe it's going to focus. There it goes. Sticks out a little. I don't know. I like it. I think it's neat. But also, I wanted to try it out and see how nicely they fit. That's pretty good. I'm digging it. Oh, let's try one more thing. Uh, I have no idea where it is. Okay, hang on. Ta-da! I found it. Zayas. Again, I've already really checked out this stuff on uh, the GBA video, but I don't expect everyone looking... I don't expect everyone to watch all of my videos, you know? Why would you watch a GBA video when you're interested in the GBA SP kit? Anyway. So let's take a look at the frame FRM feature a little bit more. I'm going to turn that volume down. Uh, so I've explained this before um, about a million times, especially when I do the Lynx Awakening tests um, for other kits. But uh, the original Game Boy didn't have a way of doing transparency effects on screen. Um, and the pixel response times of the original LCDs was just so terrible that um, devs thought of a clever little trick that they decided to employ um, where they just flicker a sprite on and off as fast as they possibly can and the horrible pixel response time of the LCD would mask that and actually result in a nice transparency effect. Well, the devs of this particular game that I'm playing, Zass, uh, took that one step further, and the entire background is transparent. Um, it actually looks really sick on an original Game Boy screen, uh, all things considered, I guess. Uh, <laughs> com compared to other games, compared to how other games look on an original Game Boy screen. Um, and... Whew, totally lost my train of thought there. Um... No, it looks pretty good, but with how the backlight kits are, this is one of the first backlight kits that can really display this game without looking terrible. If we disable the FRM feature, you can see, yeah, now everything's a flickery mess. Again, not unplayable, just less than ideal. Ooh, almost flew into that. Um, but as you can see, everything's definitely working totally fine. Buttons included. Oops. My ability to play this game notwithstanding. But yeah, I see no reason not to just leave this on. Um, maybe at some point in the future I will do... I'll get some lag testing equipment set up and properly do uh, tests for this sort of stuff. Uh, but until then, with the tools I have right now, um, any ability to measure, like any, any differences I measure will just be down to margin of error. I don't have precise enough equipment to do it properly, so I'm not even going to try right now. Uh, but yeah, totally fine. Um, I, I don't know. It's pretty decent. I don't have any issues with it. Um, the new shells, very nice, very nice, very pleased with this. I have been playing with the prototype shell that they sent me a little while back, which honestly feels identical to this one, uh, with one exception. My prototype doesn't have the little screw bumpers, just because they weren't done at the time, so it closes a little bit harder than this one does. But other than that, you know, it, it feels fine. I haven't had any single issues with this thing. Um, battery life notwithstanding, but I only have so many SP batteries. Um, trust me, I, I was actually playing it. I, I took the battery out to, to 
to do this video. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, now the shell's been fine, the buttons have been fine. Um, now that I'm trying out Funny Playing's buttons, like I said, it's kind of weird that they don't spring up uh, the same way OEM does. But I don't know, like these? You can hear they make a little bit more clicky than these. Or hopefully you can hear that. Hopefully my phone picked that up. Uh, it's not bad, it's just, it's different. Um, quite frankly, it could be down to the SP itself, I don't know. Like I said, I found this motherboard on my desk. It's something that I had, had, had sitting in housing like this and was literally using just to plug kits into and make sure the kits worked. But I worked through all of those kits and then I never reassembled that SP, so... I don't know. Um, yeah. It's fine. I, I'll throw links to all this stuff down in the description if you want to check out the um, LED button board from Funny Playing, the housing from Funny Playing, the membranes from Funny Playing, the buttons from Funny Playing, and the uh, uh, screen kit from Funny Playing. All of them pretty good. Works pretty well together. Um, if I had to find a complaint, not that I really think there's anything to complain about, but it realistically is my job with this sort of content. Um, if I had to find a complaint, the fact that it doesn't come with a sticker is a little bit of a bummer, but again, you know, it's not really that big of a deal, especially because I would likely be using my own stickers anyway, because Funny Playing wouldn't be including these. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess the only real thing is the screen. I don't like how that fits. I don't like how easy that is to push in. That feels... I don't know. It doesn't feel right. So one of the things that... Here, let's, let's look at my DIY ITA screen here. You can see this is using a different brand lens because Funny Playing doesn't make... They do make SP lenses but they don't make and sell them separately. They only make them to include with their kits. Uh, this lens is from Cloud Game Store, and you can see it has the same shape as a normal SP lens. So on the bottom, it kind of curves down, and you have this bottom section here. And then on the top, we have these two tabs on the left and right. Funny Playing doesn't do that. It's just a square of glass. The Funny Playing method is probably making these things significantly cheaper in bulk, um, but one thing these tabs do is they provide something for the housing to grab onto, so you can't just push it into the housing. Um, but Funny Playing doesn't do that, and I don't know why. It's something that can be fixed with just spacers behind the screen, or at least something that can be alleviated, but Funny Playing gives you a piece of foam, and the foam's not sufficient to do that, so... Your mileage may vary, I guess. Um, but otherwise, the performance of the kit itself is pretty good. I don't think it's going to really replace the 9380 kits, um, at least not for me. I personally think the 9380 kits are like peak Game Boy screens at this point, and these are a little bit of a downgrade between the fact that they're a little bit smaller um, and they don't have integer scaling. Granted, the scaling that they do have is not bad. Do not get me wrong. It is perfectly serviceable. It works great. It actually looks good in-game. I just like the look of the 9380s better. That being said, I don't think you can go wrong with one of these things. They look fantastic. Especially in an actual game. Like, yes, I was showing you synthetic tests. And yes, I can point out errors in the synthetic tests, but when you're actually playing a game, you know, tell me, does that look bad? Because that doesn't look bad to me. That looks, that looks pretty darn good. Um, I, I hesitate to say there's a better looking kit in an actual game. Especially with the FRM feature. Like, if you play any game that has any flickering, which Pokemon is not one of those games, but F-Zero, um, I think just about any of the Legend of Zelda games, but especially Link's Awakening, 
um, Castlevania. Yeah, those are the only ones I know offhand. Uh, oh, Mario Kart. Yeah, you, you can only name four games. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's not bad. I think it's a step in the right direction, but if you're looking for the Fables endgame, we're not there yet. I don't, I don't know if we'll ever be there, but this, this isn't it. I think there's still a little bit of ways to go. Um, a killer feature in my mind would be, uh, the color filters that they have, except the other way, instead of oversaturating the colors, let's try desaturating the colors so it looks a little bit uh, better. Um, the original Game Boy Advance screens, like these things, the non-backlit ones, these things were notoriously very dark. Um, it's just how it was. It wasn't even the fact that they had no internal lighting, which they didn't. There was no internal lighting, uh, but they were also just flat out dark, um, especially compared to Game Boy Color screens, which also had no internal lighting. Um, of course, with them unpowered, you can't really tell, but you'll have to take my word for it. Uh, in-game, they were just dark, and that wasn't really that big of an issue, because devs would try and work around this issue by intentionally oversaturating the colors in their games, so that when they were eventually displayed on the darker screen, they appeared somewhat normal. Um... These screens do not have that problem, so they display the oversaturated colors faithfully, and quite frankly, it, it just looks bad in some games. I think Golden Sun is one of the most notorious examples, where, like, right at the beginning of the game, you have this cloudy, overcast, you know, rainstorm weather, but, like, on an actual Game Boy, it's this, like, bright green, sunny, shiny day, but with rain, and it just looks silly. But on an original Game Boy, advance um it looks totally fine so yeah it's a weird thing i think they still need to improve that but i'm i'm having a hard time communicating specifically what i uh what i think they should do um but we'll get there eventually that being said this is a fantastic kit and if you want to build a game boy right now i don't think you can go wrong um just don't be surprised if you check again next year and there's a kit that has extra features. Um, there's there's always something new coming, is all I'm trying to say. Um, anyway, thanks again to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending this stuff my way to check out. There will be some links in the description. Uh, also in the description is a link to the site that I maintain uh, that also has some links to like my spreadsheet of power usage and brightness measurements and such. Um, after I'm done recording this video, I'm going to go measure the brightness of this screen and add it to the spreadsheet. I will measure with, um, hmm, I don't remember what I did the other one, what I did the Game Boy Advance one. If I measured the Game Boy Advance one with the pixel grid on, I'll measure this one with the pixel grid off or vice versa. Um, I don't know, because it will affect the brightness. But I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, otherwise, that's all I've got. Um, thanks for watching, guys. I know this was a long one, um, longer than they usually are, um, at least for screen mods. I usually keep those to 45, 50 minutes or so, maybe an hour if something runs long, but this one's running especially long. But but it was a twofer, because I did I, I did the thing to... Anyway, whatever. You, you don't need me to explain it. All right, guys, that's all I've got. Um, thanks for watching. Keep on being awesome.